Greetings, my brothers and sisters. This is Minister Adam Butts with JCC's Sunday School lesson for February 16th, 2020. Sunday School is now in session. Today's lesson is titled, In Boyd's, A Prayer of Jesus. In the International Sunday School lesson, it's titled, Kingdom Seeking Prayer. The scripture for today comes from Matthew 6, chapter 6, verses 9 through 15. And the main thought comes from Matthew 6, 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this lesson, Jesus continued to, with what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we discussed how Jesus taught the disciples how not to practice a faith centered around personal gain and increasing their own worldly reputation. Jesus then showed them how not to pray. This week, Jesus teaches the disciples and us how to pray. The lesson picks up here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if you forgive man's their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not man's their trespasses, neither will your father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Jesus began this prayer with our father, which translated Abba, which is translated daddy. The word to address God is in relation to a very personal and intimate relation with God. The word Abba does not appear in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they use Ab to address their fathers, such as the head of the household, their earthly father. It was unusual for a Jew in that day to refer to God as the father that we're talking about. They considered Abba too intimate. See here, Abba is representing God as the head of his people. He is the creator and he is the great parent of all. The principle here, Jesus is showing the disciple to say Abba because it's beyond the common term used as a child of a, of a human being. Abba is a word pregnant with the future. It is grounded in the union with the eternal son, which makes us all sons of God, the most high. And no longer is this a privilege solitary only to Jews. We all as believers are now members of the great family of God. See, sometimes it's a privilege for some of us to have a relationship with our earthly father. This type of privilege and relationship comes because we share this bloodline and traits. Now, because of Jesus, we have an internal, intimate relation with our heavenly father because of the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood actually grafted us into the family. We now have the privilege of calling our Heavenly Father, Abba, Daddy. This is a personal relationship. Of all the names represented of God's being and his character, Abba is the fullest and his truest representing this close relationship that we can have with our fathers. Jesus said that our prayers should be based on a personal relationship with our father. Yet, yeah. one thing I find interesting here is throughout this prayer was commonly used is our and us. For example, he starts off by saying our father down in line that forgive us our debts as we forgive others. What we'll find here is there is a plural form of saying this. This means that even in our secret prayers. We're to recognize and be mindful of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should make our requests just like their request to our father who art in heaven. 
This prayer is very important because we can recognize that as brothers and sisters, you can imagine sitting at the helm of our earthly father. And when we sit from this earthly father, whom we turn to in a need when we are hungry and we can't get stuff for ourselves, we can turn and say, Daddy, would you feed us? Daddy, would you nourish us? We have to have that relationship with Father, uh, our Father being God, Abba, where we're all his children so we can go to him as our Father who art in heaven. That brings us to the next part of this verse which says, which art in heaven. Now, this doesn't confine God to the presence in heaven because he is omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. This is just one short description of his divine glory, his majesty, his dominion, and his omnipotence. Which out in heaven distinguish him from our earthly fathers or false gods who are not in heaven. Heaven being this region of bliss and happiness. Where God dwells, happiness dwell. Where God dwells, peace dwell. Where God dwells, our troubles are no more. We can have heaven here on earth if God dwells in us. As we move on through this prayer, what we'll find that these first three petitions in this prayer, the first three things that are asked for God in this prayer, they're asking that God's name, his kingdom, and his will be put in this proper context. Starting with, hallowed be thy name. You know what? If we take that and we switch that around, I think we can get a better understanding. The petitioner here is asking thy name be made holy. When we look at this, what we'll find that the petitioner here, the person that's praying is asking that God's name be kept holy. The worshiper has a desire that God's name is highly honored or exalted for who he is, for his attributes, and for his works. The petitioner adds that God's universal existence be believed by all. His perfection be revered and loved. His works be admired and his omnipotence, his power, and his authority be acknowledged. And that his glory be manifested everywhere. See, let us celebrate, let us be celebrated when it comes to God's name. Let's celebrate his name. His name should be cherished and esteemed as holy everywhere and received by all people in proper honor. It is the wish or the desire of the person that's praying this prayer that God name. And let's be honest, there's something about that name. It should be held everywhere in proper adoration. Hallowed be thy name. As we move down to verse 10, we get the other two petitions here about God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. It starts off with thy kingdom come. The word kingdom means that God reigns. May you reign over earth as we know you reign in heaven. But the word kingdom come. Come means that God's heaven, uh, earthly kingdom has not been fully completed yet. It means that the kingdom of God is under the Messiah is to be set up. Is to be enlarged, is to be perfected by their preaching of the gospel and their exercise of Jesus' kingly power. This partition asks God for three key things about his kingdom that we and all men may receive the kingdom of divine grace into our heart. And that God may reign in and over us so much in a manner that we may be his willing and loyal subjects. 
It also asks that he would enlarge the borders of his church and bring all nations within the fold and that God would proceed by his grace more and more to destroy the powers of sin and the dominion over Satan and also to implant his fear as well as his love into the hearts of all people. Thy kingdom come. The last petition here says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is that we are not to be resigned into the fate of the world. We don't have to just walk around as though whatever comes, comes. Whatever will be, will be. No, but by praying to God that his perfect will be accomplished in this world as well as the next. How do God accomplish this? Largely through the people who is willing to obey him. The will of God that people should obey is his law and to be holy. That's what God will. God's will is that we obey his law and that we be holy. The word will here has reference to his law and to what would be acceptable to him. So when we say God's will, we're talking about his law and we're talking about what is acceptable to God. May God's will be done. May what is acceptable to God be done. The prayer here is that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, we pray that his law and his exposed will may be obeyed and loved. See, God law, God's law is perfectly obeyed in heaven. But we, his children, must eagerly desire and pray that it may also be obeyed here on earth. As a matter of fact, as we pray this prayer, we're offering ourselves to be the doers of God's will. We're asking him to guide us. We're asking him to lead us. And we're asking him to, to uh, give us the means to fulfill his purpose. God is not our will, but may your will be done. Those are the three petitions here that this prayer starts out. That God's names be exalted. That he reign both on heaven and on earth. And his will also be done here on earth as well as in heaven. God's desires and God's will is far more important than our will and our desire. And therefore, we must consider these first. This is why this is the first part of the prayer. And once we acknowledge his will, once we acknowledge his desire, now we can inquire about our desires. And that brings us to verse 11. Give us our daily bread. You know what? I'm so glad that Jesus was not so heavenly minded that he was no earthly good. Empathizing with us and the needs of us here on earth, God sent Jesus here as fully God and fully human. Therefore, Jesus had pain. He hungered. He he was tempted. Jesus not understood our needs, but he also endured what we have to endure. Jesus showed us here that God is actually concerned with our basic needs as human, along with our spiritual needs. We have this this misconception that we provide our own daily needs. Picture this. Picture how vain we will look asking God for bigger cars, larger homes, more money, more land. And higher paying jobs as if what we currently have, we did it ourselves. So, God, I just need you to provide the extra. I just need you to put the icing on the cake, if you will. The truth is, we would not be able to breathe, nor have food, nor clothes or shelter without God's provisioning. 
And I'm not talking about his provisioning for tomorrow, for tomorrow is not promised. We need his provision today. God give us our daily bread, our daily manna. As the Israelites wandered around the wilderness due to their own disobedience, God provided them with manna each morning. He provided water even if it had to come from rocks when it was needed. God provided them with, uh, protected them day and night as a cloud and as fire. The provisions were provided to them daily to meet their daily needs, God provided for them. I'm so glad that God is still in the daily provisioning business. It would be out of pure pride for us to not recognize him enough to ask him for our daily bread. Matthew 6, 34, Jesus says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. God, we need enough of your provision today, our daily bread to get through it. We're not strong enough. We're not savvy enough. Neither are we smart enough to get through a single day without your grace, without your mercy, and moreover, without your provision. Give us our daily bread. And as we move down to verse 12, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debt is asking God to forgive us our sins. As a matter of fact, Romans three, uh, Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, if the wages of sin is death. And Jesus died for our sins. We are therefore indebted to him. This is a debt that we're not holy enough to pay back. We're not clean enough to repay. But our sins are washed away because we can be reconciled with God through Christ. There's only one problem. The problem is. That we continue to sin day after day. This is why we have to continuously ask for forgiveness. And we need to ask for this as often as possible. Forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Now, what I like about this is Jesus said, forgive us our debts. And we know our debts are sins. But then Jesus added this conjunction in there. He said, as See, as is used to indicate that something happens during the time when something else is taking place. God, as we forgive our debts, the debts of others, I ask at the same time you forgive my debts or sins unto you. How can we come to God harboring dark and vengeful thoughts? How can we expect God to show us that mercy which we are not willing to? To show others. God, as I obey you and forgive my brothers, I ask that you forgive me for my sins that I commit. Forgive other sins. uh, um, We forgive other sins at the same time we ask for you to forgive our sins. As we move down a little bit further to verse 13, which read, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we start with this, it says, lead us not into temptation. The petitioner, the person praying here, offers a similar, uh, as a matter of fact, David offered a similar thing in Psalms 144 verse four, when he said, incline not my heart, to any evil thing, to practice practice wicked works with the workers of iniquity. David asked the same thing in the Old Testament. We'll find also that James, in James 1, 13, it says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor 
does he tempt anyone? So, lead us not into temptation. This actually leads us to understand this phrase more as permitting. God, do not permit us to be tempted by sin. This is to say God has control over the tempter to save us from their power, which they have upon us. So while God may not move the temptation, he will provide a way out of it for us. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let or permit you to be tempted beyond your ability. But when the temptation with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This means that with God on our side, we can handle whatever temptation that comes our way. This is saying, lead us not into temptation, which means don't allow this to happen to us. As the verse continues, it says, but deliver us from the evil one. Here, the petitioner is asking God to deliver us from the various evil and trials which torments us. Also from the heavy and oppressive calamities which we are continually liable to fall. We're asking not to be tempted beyond what we can bear. So when we put that together, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We're asking God, God, don't allow the temptation to come that will actually overtake us. Give us a way out, Father. And we can find this way out only by praying to him. And this is why Jesus asks us to pray in this manner when it comes to being tempted. The verse it concludes, verse 13 concludes with a dexology. Dexology, I'm sorry. Dexology is a, a short hymn of praise to God. Here we're saying, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Well, what you'll find is in Luke account of the prayer, it's not included. As a matter of fact, if we were to look at other translations of the Bible, such as um, the NRSV or the NIV translation, you will not find this textology in there. However, one of the things that uh, one of the reasons why it might have been added, that it was very common um, for the Jews when they pray, they would add this to the end of their prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. But let's break this down a little bit. For thy is the kingdom. That is, thy has the reign and dominion. God has control over all things and can order them to answer these petitions. Thine is the power. God has the power to accomplish what we ask. We are weak and we can't do it. But he is almighty and all things are possible with him. Thy is the glory. That is, he is to be honored and praised, not for our honor, but that his glory, his goodness may be displayed in providing our wants. His power exercised in defending us. In other words, as God light shows in us, as what God provides for us show up as we're the light of the earth, People should see that and see God in it. It's not our power, it's God's power. It's not our kingdom, it's God's kingdom. And the glory of God that shows up in us, he must get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. This actually concluded the prayer that Jesus, uh, the manner of prayer that Jesus told the disciples to pray. However, Jesus continued on to speak. So as we move down to verses 14 and 15, which reads, for if ye forgive man their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not man their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses. Let's start this off with your heavenly father will also forgive you. 
This is consistent throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, Jesus warns us, especially in the New Testament as he goes through, he warns us over and over and over again about the importance of forgiveness. If we refuse to forgive, God will not forgive us. But why? Why is there an if then clause when it comes to forgiveness? If we don't forgive, my brothers and sisters, then we are denying our common ground with our brother, which is the need for God's help. All of God's children, we all need the help of God. So we must forgive because we must be forgiven by our father. Brothers and sisters, if you're like me, you consistently have to ask God for forgiveness. I fall every day. And because of that, uh, because of the fact that Jesus died for my sins, it's actually easier for me now to recognize that I've sinned. And it's even easier for me now to ask for forgiveness. But what's hard and what is painful and what requires me to swallow my pride and what can have me up all night plotting revenge is forgiving others. Knowing that we have to uh, forgive to be forgiven is actually somewhat of a measuring stick when it comes to the growth that we allow Jesus to abide in us. The more we die to our own desires, the more Jesus can enter into our lives. If you're someone here on this that's struggling with forgiveness, I pray that God incline your heart to trust his provision and trust his purpose for you. Because I can assure you this, his provision and his purpose that he has for you is greater than any hurt that you've ever had to endure. Brothers and sisters, this is the model prayer Jesus taught the disciples and actually is one many of us learn as a child. Like you, uh, I'm sorry, like me, I should say, <laughs> you, may, you may not have understood his meaning, which made the prayer actually more like the vain repetition that Jesus said on the Gentiles. You're speaking something that you don't know the meaning of, which makes it vain. But when we know better, we can pray better. Brothers and sisters, teach your children not only to be able to recite this model prayer, but more important, to understand the model prayer. God bless you all. This is Minister Adam Butts with JCC's Sunday School lesson for February 16 of 2020. You guys have a great week and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen.